Welcome. And we welcome you to this program today. You're going to be blessed out of your socks. Absolutely. Do so not change that channel. <laughs> take your socks off because you're going to be blessed out of them. Absolutely. So we're going to have a great time. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum is with us today. And he is a... What would you he say? He is a world-renowned Messianic Jewish scholar. And he's, the book is Chosen Fruit, and it is his story today. But you're going to find out a lot more. You can just see God's hand was on this man from the time he was born, even his mom and dad. He is well-traveled. He's traveled by foot, probably by donkey, but... <laughs> Certainly, he has traveled all over the world. And still does. And you're going to be blessed. And music by Bobby, Ma Babby Mason. <laughs> and uh, she is a wonderful, wonderful woman of God yes. that loves God. And she's going to open our program today with God will open up the windows. I wrote this song after being inspired by Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and you won't have room enough to receive it. This is my prayer for you today. God will open, open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God will open. Open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God will open, he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And you will not have the room, not because of you. But because he is good And you will not have the room To receive it Well, well, God will open He'll open up the windows of heaven And pour you out a blessing Well, God will open He'll open up the windows And pour you out a blessing Blessing. Oh, you are a blessing. Yes, and you will not have the room, not because of you, but because he's good, and you will not have the room to receive. about the God I serve, how he keeps on blessing me, and he'd still be worthy of all my praise if he didn't do another thing, but he woke me up and he started me along my way, while the blood is still running warm in my veins, I'm in the land. Don't be 
believe you've really been blessed. Take another look and see. He put clothes on your back and food on your table and supplied every one of your needs. So instead of thanking God for things that you don't have yet, thank God for what you have and what you have left. I know that you will find you really been He'll open up the window and pour you on a blessing. God will open up. Yes, he will. And pour you on a blessing. I do believe that God will open. I know he's able. He'll pour you on a blessing. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you will. Not because of you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Well, well, you will not have the room. Not because of you. God's really been good to you. Well, well, and you will not have the room to receive it. Thank you, Babby. Wow, good music. And we have a scholar with us today. One of uh, the best. The best, <laughs> or probably. Or many would say the, the best, best in the world, not just this country. And it's all about Messianic Jewish perspective on how he interprets the Bible, how he interprets the Word of God and all the background to every scripture. Yeah. And uh, what a blessing. It's a joy to have you today. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> well, we're going to uh, talk about your life a little bit because uh, we're going to have to have you back. <laughs> and I'll be happy to A lot back. to cover. <laughs> and yes, talk about some back. of these books. But you were born in Siberia. That's Russia. Very much so. <laughs> yep. And he reminded me how cold it is yes. in Siberia. And, and where did you go from there? Well, we stayed there until the war ended. Now, we're not Russian, we're Polish, basically. My father fled Poland when uh, the Nazis came in. He crossed the border into Russia, then got arrested for crossing the border. And uh, although he was Jewish, they accused him of being a Nazi spy and shipped him out to a concentration camp in Siberia. Oh. He stayed there for two years, till 1941, and when Hitler attacked Russia, the, uh, the Russians were in need of the political support of the Polish government, now exiled in England. And the Polish government in exile said, we agree, but you have to release all Polish citizens. My father got released. He stayed in Siberia till the war ended. Meanwhile, my mother was shipped from another part of Russia. She had just turned 18. She needed to get new identification papers. She needed a um, passport type pictures. So the, she found out about a photographer, which was my father's business. So she went to see my father. She got a picture taken, and I developed. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> so I was born in Siberia during the war in 1943. When, what time, what age did you leave? At three. At three. So I remember nothing about Siberia. Yeah. Now, and so we were able to go back to Poland. Poland had become communistic, so there were no political differences. And we'll, we settled in Poland, a small Jewish community, surrounded by the Polish community, which was Rome, mostly Roman Catholic. And um, we lived there about a year. And then when the Passover started to approach, 
uh, our mothers began to bake what we call matzahs, matzot, the unleavened bread for Passover. And during the week of preparations, a small three-year-old Roman Catholic boy disappeared. And the leaders began to spread the rumor they often spread before, order for the Jews to make unleavened bread for Pesach, Passover, we have to have the blood of a, of a Christian. So accused Ooh. of kidnapping the boy, killing him for ritual murder, and using his blood to make the bread. And it spread all over Poland very quickly. And so on the first night, there were several Passover riots. Wow. That's, that's the first time I heard about Jesus in that context, but not someone who came to die for me, someone we ended up to die for. And as a result, Jews were killed in Jesus' name. Hmm. But that sparked the work of the Israeli underground. Back then it was called the Palestinian underground, where Israel had not yet become a stake. But um, they were, the, uh, we called them now the Israeli underground. They bribed the Polish border guards to allow certain Jews to leave within a fixed period of time. And where it reached us that we had those 30 days, we were told not to use public transportation, only walk from the town of Ludz uh, to the border. And we arrived there, the Polish border guards took their rifles, put them up behind their backs. They just raised their eyes skyward and told us, went like this, that was across the border, we we'll pretend not being able to see you. And that's how we got out. Wow. Later from the Israelis, we found out how much it took to bribe them. It took several cartons of American cigarettes. <laughs> really? <laughs> and each year, American cigarettes were highly valued after World War II. So for, say, for a carton of Camel cigarettes, you can purchase the freedom of a family of Jews. That's yeah. how we got out. So while smoking is bad for your health, it was good for mine. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one day I did walk a mile for a camel. <laughs> <laughs> and so we then basically walked across the width of the Czechoslovak, uh, Czechoslovak uh, country, heading for the Austrian border. They had made a similar arrangement with the Czech border guards. But the day before we scheduled to actually do the crossing, the government collapsed, the communists took over. And we're told we, uh, and they removed all of the Czech border guards with whom arrangements had been made to get us across, and Russian border police replaced them. And so they told us to sit tight in the forest. They went to the border town to investigate. What they discovered was that the Russians were given orders to allow no one to cross the border except for Greeks. Greeks least recently released from prisons and returning back to Greece. When they found that out, they came back, were told to burn anything to identify what we were. So all identification papers, passports, all those things went up in smoke. The next morning, we're told to pose as Greeks. And pretending to be Greeks, we approached the Russians at the Czech-Austrian border. Now, not one of us was a Greek. No one in our group could speak a word of Greek, but neither could the Russians. <laughs> So he made it fast safely across into Austria. So I found myself a unique example of Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I was a Jew first, and for one day also a Greek. <laughs> that's the story of how we got out. Wow. What an interesting story. And then from Greece, you didn't go to, you went to Greece? No, no, no. They, they were oh. traveling through Czechoslovakia and Austria to get to Greece. Right. But once we got across the American and peace took over and brought us into what was then the American zone of West Germany. And with the next five years we spent in camps called displaced persons camps, which were camps for Jews that had no citizenship in any country anymore. Mm. We moved this one camp to another, they vetted us to make sure we had no communistic leanings and things of that nature. And after five years we were given our immigration status. But before we left, there was a German Lutheran minister, a pastor who was working on behalf of a Jewish ministry in New York City. And so we left, uh, he, uh, his main job was to give us uh, clothing to Jewish refugees, which is what we were. He and his daughter made several visits to that one camp, we were there for about a year. I was not involved in the conversations, I was a small boy. I don't know what they talked about, but I do know is that when he learned that we were applying for immigration status to the USA. Happened to have a, a magazine called The Chosen People, published by this Messianic group in New York City, in Manhattan. And so he told my mother, he took the, took the cover off, my mother never saw the whole magazine. 
<laughs> so she didn't know what this group was. <laughs> she assumed it was just uh, some kind of a Jewish group in America that would help immigrant Jews, which it was. It was a bit more than that, and by the time I had found that out, it was too late in my case. Can I go back just a little yeah. bit? Would you give a little background about the Fortchenbaum family and what, if the war had not happened, because uh, you've got some interesting details in your family history right. of, you know, would you just talk about your great-great-grandfather and all that would have come down to you had the war not started? Right. My um, grandfather and his father before him were members of a Hasidic group. The Hasids are the ultra-Orthodox, not mainland orthodoxy, but they're the ultra-Orthodox. You see them in all the pictures with the long black clothing, yeah. yes. the black skull caps, the furry hats, yeah. long beards, also the side curls on the sides of the heads. And they, they required the very strict adherence to the Torah, the Mosaic law, but also a strict adherence to all of the laws passed down by the rabbis over the last several centuries. And uh, the authority, and so when the movement broke up in different divisions because of not, uh, not theology, but geography, each division had one, had one person who was the leader, not quite the rabbi, it was called the Rebbe, R-E-B-B-E. -E. And uh, my grandfather was, uh, was the Rebbe of this one group in the town of Poltusk, about uh, 50 miles north of Warsaw. Mm -hmm. And um, an authority would be passed down from father to son, and so when he died, my father was the firstborn son. And um, before he could really begin moving that way, that's when Hitler attacked and uh, World War II began. But so now your father taught you a lot in that exactly. displaced persons camp, didn't he? Right, and when uh, he, has, he, had, he, he shed his Hasidic clothing and all that, yeah, he which he started he shaved his beard off. You know, they had these, but he's he's the one that taught me on my early Bible, because then these this these camps we lived in for five years there was we were like wasn't any real jobs that we had to do, it was all supplied by uh, the American government. But um, my father was a photographer. So he would make uh, cards for Hanukkah, for Rosh Hashanah, good, the Jewish New Year, and things of that nature. But every day he would pull out his Hebrew Bible, which he knew well, read it, and then translate it to me either in Polish or Yiddish, which was the two languages I grew up with. So my early Bible came from him. That's amazing. Now your, father, your mother was an atheist. She, yeah, she was an atheist. Eventually he also became an he atheist, became but not at that point. Yeah. By the time he died, he became an atheist because he lost 17 members of his family hmm. for the yeah. Holocaust. And he didn't want to hear about Christianity because Christians then represented for him, that people was that hated you all. That was Christianity to him. Because yeah. from the fourth century, 95% of all persecutions were in the name of the three C's, church, Christ, cross. Hmm. So that's why in Jewish um, uh, ministries, we don't use those terms because the Jewish mind has a the opposite meaning to what it means for those who truly believe. Mm -hmm. So place of Christ is, is, the, um, is Messiah or Mashiach. In place of uh, church, it's the Keila or, or assembly. And we just, in the state of cross, it's a tree. Because she used those other terms, so right away they, well, they, what comes to mind, these are the signs of persecution, not the signs leading to salvation. Mm. That's so. something. Well, then you come to America and your father is really having a hard time understanding the English language. So uh, eventually, also he gets you out of New York. You move right. from one neighborhood to another because uh, you're the being... But the, <laughs> the neighborhood changed. We, when we move into a neighborhood to be Jewish for a while, then we change to a different kind of neighborhood. So you move it and finally he went to move to California. But because 99% of his business was within the Jewish community, he didn't need, he didn't need to know English. Because yeah. all yeah. the Jews spoke Yiddish. And these were all immigrant Jews. The Yiddish was the spoken language on the streets of, of Brooklyn and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. He actually learned enough to communicate, but never learned enough to read or understanding. So he, he subscribed to Yiddish newspaper that he would read every day called The Forwards, coming from New York. So that's... Uh, a mother who's, who's, who speaks um, five languages, still yeah. at she age of 93. She spoke pretty good English, didn't she? She learned English very quickly. Yeah. And um, within, the, within a matter of months, she was very fluent. So all the legal documents and so on, she had to read and translate to my father 
because he would not be able to understand them. And she answered the phone for the business because he eventually opened up his own photography. Photography, and she had oh. to make the phone calls, answer the phone calls. He would not know yeah. how, uh, how to deal with that, yeah. And in the meantime, she had a son and a daughter. In Germany, she had a son and a daughter besides me. And then in Brooklyn, we had another brother, another son. And then when I was expelled from home, she had three more daughters after I was expelled from home. Mm -hmm. And the last two were twins, yeah. so seven kids all together, but between me and the younger sisters, 22 years, so I could have been their father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you actually didn't grow up speaking Hebrew? No, we didn't, uh, because uh, he, the only Hebrew my father knew was Biblical Hebrew, but nobody speaks Biblical Hebrew, not the same as modern Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So I learned he modern Hebrew later when I went to Hebrew University in Jerusalem. But I grew up with, with, uh, with Yiddish and Polish and then picked up Brooklynese. <laughs> and mm. Brooklyn has its own accent, but nobody in Brooklyn had any problem understanding me. We moved to California because of my thick accent. They, after one week in California, they put me into speech impediment class. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the book. That was yeah. funny. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> We're going to take a break and... Uh, Babby Mason's going to sing for us again. Yes. And when we come back, we're going to take up from Jesus. there and <laughs> your life with Christ. Great. He met the Messiah. <laughs> Babby Mason. Terry Tripp's Empower Minute. I have discovered that success isn't to get through the scriptures, but rather to get the scriptures through me. Big difference. It's not about getting information, but revelation, transformation. How much time should you spend in the Word every day? Spend enough time to make a memory. That could be seven chapters, one chapter, three words, one word from God can change your life forever. Spend long enough to where it brands your thinking. Make a memory in God's Word today. That's why I support this station. They give the good news of the gospel something worth thinking about. Take a moment, financially support them, and help others set their minds on God's Word.
with a new assurance. More and more I understand His words of love. I will never know just why He came to save me till someday. I see his beautiful face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so talking to Arnold and the book The Chosen Fruit is what really we're talking about today the unbelievable steps of Arnold and where he went and how he got there and I guess we left off you as a teenager yes and uh you're in America. In America, we, just, we arrived. In California. Moved into a, a uh, Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn. And, uh, and to me, of course, everybody that wasn't Jewish was a Gentile, which was true, but it was also a Christian in my mind, and the most Jewish minds, because they, really? don't, they, don't, they don't make a contrast between the two. But my mother did. She was given the cover of the Chosen People magazine. We settled in Brooklyn. She took a subway ride to Manhattan. And uh, she tried to talk to somebody the day she was there, but uh, she did not speak English yet. Nobody down that day could speak Russian or Polish or German or Yiddish, all of which my mother spoke, <sighs> very fluent. So all that got done that day is her name was taken down on a three by five card. It was conveyed to her in some way. We'd be contacted sometime later. Sometime later was six years later. <laughs> oh, really? But then when they opened up, uh, uh, called the East, the East New York branch of the of the mission. That's only about a mile away from where we were living. So, somebody's been collecting these three by five cards of contacts, pulled them out, and gave it to different workers to visit and invite them over to the new branch. So, that's when Ruth Waddell came into our lives. She knocked on the door, started to talk, and uh, invited us to attend. But she called a Jewish Christian meeting, which made no sense to me at that point. So uh, I decided to go more out of curiosity than anything else. And it was a very small room. It was a fellowship hall of a church. The church was across the street, so we didn't have to meet in the church. But the fellowship hall was then across the street. And so what she did, what they did was teach about the Messiah and all that. But it really bothered me is they kept using the, the Old Testament to do it with. Because I grew up to believe that we produce our own Bible. We simply called it the Bible. Christians called the Old Testament, and uh, the Christians had their own Bible, the New Testament, and of course their Bible talked about this God named Jesus. He wasn't supposed to be anywhere in my Bible. <laughs> so, and so Ruth Waddell, who could, could tell, she ever talked to me a couple of times, and she, she, she writes in her own biography that uh, she was surprised how much Bible I knew at my age. But, uh, but she, did. she just gave me a challenge to take a New Testament home with me, read it for myself, and see if Jesus didn't do what the Messiah was, I was supposed to do. 
And I, I took it not because I was open-minded. I was just going to prove these schizophrenics wrong, taking the Gamipo Jews and Christians. But as I began to read the New Testament for the first time, well, I was kind of stunned. Because I, I, what I thought I would read is about these big church edifices, stained glass windows, black robe priests, waving crosses, and telling the congregants, go out and kill Jews in Jesus' name. Wow. That's what I saw who called people who called themselves Christians doing in Europe. I thought that's where it came from, but to my surprise, it was very much a Jewish book. And Matthew 1, 1 begins, the generations of, of uh, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, you can't get more Jewish than that line is. No. <laughs> so that turned my thinking around to what this book was, was not what I thought it was going to be. So I went back the second time, and this time I sat down. I wasn't angry anymore. We went from the Hebrew Bible to the New Testament, back and forth, back and forth. Everything clicked together. That night I became a believer in the Messiahship of Yeshua, the Messiahship of Jesus. So you were convinced on your own after reading all of the fulfilled prophecies well, in the New well, Testament? Uh, well, I was with her when she was doing it, so it wasn't yeah. just alone. She was actually yeah. leading me from prophecy to prophecy. And then uh, through her witness and uh, moving the two, so I became convinced from the Old Testament prophecy, particularly Isaiah 53, was the main passage for yes. me to come to faith. Now, can I ask you something? Um, I've been told that Isaiah 53 is not in a lot of Jewish Bibles today. Is that true? No, it's in every Jewish Bible. I think the misconception comes that in the synagogue readings, they divide the Torah, the five books of Moses, into 54 divisions. Mm -hmm. No matter what synagogue you go to, the same passage is read. So they, read, they repeat all, the, all of the um, Torah passages year by year. But they don't read all of the prophets, all of the writings. They do segments. Mm -hmm. And so Isaiah 53 is not among the segments they read. But I don't think you can make too much of it because there are other Isaiah passages that are not messianic involved at all mm -hmm. uh, that's also <coughs> skipped. So, so, it's, it's the, so the, the Isaiah 53 is in every Jewish Bible you pick up. Okay. But it's not part of the synagogue reading. Yeah. But that might be just a quirk, not because they deliberately avoid it. Okay. Time is flying. It's like we've got 10 more minutes in this segment. But now your father did not like this. Now you have openly told your family that Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach right. to you. And your father is purely, really furious about this. Very, very How did he treat you? Well, at that point, he uh, at first hoping I would get over it because I was a teenager. And uh, so he, um, I wanted to get baptized at that point. He, I was prayed, but it's, I never got baptized at that point in my life. And a year later, we left Brooklyn and moved, uh, the way I put it, we left Brooklyn, moved to America, and came to California. But we moved out of the Jewish areas and down in the Jewish neighborhoods of Los Angeles, which was much more was much less conservative, more, more secular, and so on. But during my years of high school in, in Los Angeles, as opposition began to grow, I was prohibited from reading uh, any part of the Bible. I was prohibited uh, from going on to any, mess any Messianic services and so on. So basically, um, my father opened up his own photography shop several miles away from the house. And I'd be, I'd be come home from school about 2 p.m. And they wouldn't be home to get home to about 5.30 p.m. So from 2 to 5.30 p.m., I had all of these study Bibles, uh, Bibles to study from, and also other books written by people like David L. Cooper, who wrote in the same Jewish perspective and so on. Mm -hmm. So I would study all that. And as soon as I heard the car coming home, I would put everything away and hide it into the drawer. So I never went into the school games or anything like that. I spent all the free time I could in studying the Bible. I knew my time was limited and then had to hide it away. Yeah. So, so he never, they never knew. That they never knew what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, and but so, then your senior year, you had a shock of shockers. Yes. What did he say to you then? Well, he knew, you I, 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 he could tell I wasn't breaking away from my beliefs. So um, I was, so when I began my senior year of high school, he simply quit speaking to me. So I lived in the same house with him for that year even ate the same table, not one word for him to me. Mm, that and must then, have been hard. It was hard. Uh, 
about two months before I graduated, he then sent me a message. Since he wouldn't talk to me, he sent it to me via my mother. And the message was that upon graduation, I would have to leave home. And not just home. You had to leave the state. He, well, yeah. Well, it, that was his request. I didn't have to leave California. You couldn't make me. <laughs> he wanted But because, like I said, most of his business is in the Jewish community, and the word spread that I was a messianic, that I, I couldn't hurt him to make a living. And he, by oh. then, you know, he had more than one kid <laughs> yes. and so on. So I honored him uh, and so I graduated. And then the day after graduation, uh, I, I began to make my way back to New York City. Can I just say this? So I, if, you, if you read the book, you could see God's hand on this man, even his family, his father, Cham, is that how you pronounce it? Chaim, Chaim. Oh boy, Chaim. I messed that up. <laughs> like, like Chaim, Chaim. <laughs> okay, I can't pronounce yeah. him, I'll just say his yeah. father. But you just see the hand of God, the protect, divine protection. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just amazing how he has led you and, and guided you and you wanted to go to college and he provided for that, but you had contacts. You didn't. You weren't out on the street. God had already given you contacts. Right. And the Messianic community that, were, that brought me to faith, they kept in contact with me. So when I left California, it took, took me two weeks to get to New York. I worked that summer at that at that uh, headquarters building, which my mother visited uh, when she first came. Mm -hmm. And when school began in September, I, I went to school. Uh, that summer, I would say, I worked at a, at a memory camp where, which to, we had to memorize 120 verses, 10 verses over a 12 week period, and then come to camp. I did that for five years. Before. But you won't say this, but I'll tell you this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he memorized and quoted at one time, at one time, 120 verses. Yes. And you were the only one that had ever done that for the several years. It was like four years five, that you went it was to the five, five year years. Program. Yeah, mm -hmm. five years. Yeah. You were the only one that did all 120 at one at, sitting. At one sitting. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. God's given you a good brain. So, you would you worked. You were at Sheldon College. Did well, you see any kind of Christian persecution? I already know the answer to that, but I want you to tell. Well, the first three years of college was Sheldon College, which followed one of the facets of uh, covenant theology, which is a, a form of replacement theology. So um, they did not see any, future, uh, any special future for Israel and so on. They also they had very, a lot of anti-Semitic tendencies and following theology I call theological anti-Semitism. <laughs> so I had swastikas printed um, when, where, where I was and things of that nature. There was a circle of friends I had there that mm -hmm. served as my protectors more or less. Mm -hmm. But lot, the school was largely uh, anti-Semitic and so on. But then um, the, the school had a major split, lost their accreditation. Another school called Cedarville College, which is now Cedarville University, but it was a college back then, let us let the students know that if, there was, if they were going to go into a senior year, they'll let them graduate after one year, because all the other schools said you have to be with us for two years. Mm -hmm. So I went to, I went to Cedarville, which then was a more of a dispensational theology, which is very pro-Israel and things of that nature, and, and everything shifted. And, I, and the, the teachers were very supportive and things of that nature. And so about my last year of college was at Cedarville in Ohio. But the interesting thing about your college is it was always paid for. And Not when I started, but when I finished, it was paid for. Uh, I would begin every year, every semester, owing their money. Every semester ended with them owing me money for seven <laughs> semesters. The eighth semester, we broke out exactly even. So I graduated in 66. With no debt? No debt. And I took out, I took out no loans. No loans and no debts. But God provided funds from people I have never met to this day. I suspect most of them are now with the Lord. but. Um, I never got to meet these people except on a couple of occasions. Wow, God is so good. You know, the Bible says in the Old Testament Psalms, I think he'll set you in families. Well, he said he'll set the lonely in families. And you couldn't go home during Christmas holidays or Thanksgiving holidays, but God provided you a family that they gave you a key to the house and like you were one of the family Actually, members. Three, the three different families gave me keys yeah. to the house. One was in Levittown, Long Island. One was just outside in 
on the Maryland side of D.C. And one was down in uh, you know, the south end of Jersey, uh, Wildwood, New Jersey. It didn't matter whether they were out there were home or not. <laughs> they, I had a key to their houses. And uh, to this day, I call them mom and pop. I call their, their children my siblings and things of that nature. Yeah. And the New Jersey family, when I graduated from college, they took out the ad in the paper that parents often oh, do. Oh, that was so neat. And uh, the, the people reading them felt it was a terrible mistake. <laughs> it says, Dr. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Cattell are happy to announce the graduation of their son, Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum. <laughs> and somebody would probably couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was so neat. So God, God took care of me and brought the right people into my life. So. Hey, but you you've always studied since you were at home. and Yeah. I love studying. I love reading. And I love developing Bible studies and so on. So I just continued that practice. I went to Hebrew University in Jerusalem uh, after I finished college and had my, um, uh, had, did my master's work in, in the historical geography of Israel. And then um, from there I went to he uh, Dallas Seminary uh, for four years, majored in Hebrew, but it was between my first and second year of seminary, I married my wife, Mary Ann. And that was interesting how you met her. <laughs> and I met you, and her family owned the property next door to the camps. So I met her seven years before I got married. Yeah, neat. I began courting her. But she was very stubborn. She kept saying no, no, no. After seven years of courtship, she finally agreed. <laughs> and so I like to tell people I worked just as hard for my wife as Jacob, my forefather, worked for his wife. <laughs> seven years. Seven years. But that scared me. It scared me because my wife has two sisters. In the Jacob story, he wanted to marry Rachel. He got stuck with Leah. That's right. Well, so before the wedding was finalized, uh, I took a piece through the veil to make sure it was the right sister. She's got two <laughs> sisters. And then I smashed the glass to finalize the wedding. <laughs> that is funny. Well, we're going to take a break. We've got more music with Betty, and we'll be right back. CTN brings exciting new programs to more communities than ever before. Watch programs such as Great Awakening with Pastor Rodney Howard Brown. He saw Jesus. You see Jesus. Abundant Life with Pastor Anthony McDaniel. And it's going to be a wonderful day, praise God, because that is a living soul. That will... Run with Fire with Roy Fields. It is time for us to stand up as Christians. You know, all over America, Awake America 365 with Bill Strayer. Does anybody want truth this morning? It is found in the precious Word of God. Real Life, Real life hosted by Monica Schmelter. Of women and men whose lives have been impacted by abortion. Turning Point with David Jeremiah. You don't just hear the sound, you feel it. Sea Fan with Daniel Kalenda. The world. And people are always saying to me, Daniel, when is it going to happen in America? Programs like these and many more make CTN a family-friendly network with a purpose, a sole purpose. The Christian Television Network.
Thank you, Babby. And uh, we've been talking with Dr. Arnold Frosamon. <laughs> I'll say it my way. It's fine. <laughs> and We're going to call him Dr. Arnold. <laughs> one of the most prolific writers that I've come across, really. And uh, this book, The Life of the Messiah, from Messianic Jewish perspective. You see it on the screen up there with the crown. And this is, he has completed two volumes and at the end of it, it's going to be four volumes. Now, it would take me years to do one, <laughs> but how long is it going to take you? Well, to get these four volumes together, it was about uh, four decades of research and study. Really? And teaching and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, when you study, uh, well, let me just say this. This man has studied for thousands of hours, probably, over your lifetime, thousands of hours. I think that was just kind of hardwired into you because you wanted to do this from a very young age. Yes. And you still desire to do it. Still do. And we were talking <laughs> a little while ago, I think some of your teachers and mentors are now using your books to teach others. Yes, they are. They are, yeah. Now that says a lot when his yeah. teachers use his material. Uh, that says he's done a lot of work. Yes. Now you have a PhD. Do you have more than one? I have a THM, a uh, Master of Theology from Dallas Seminary, and I have a PhD in Religious and Jewish Studies from NYU, New York University. Oh. Now you taught at Moody Bible Institute. As a guest speaker, I was never, I never was a faculty yeah, yeah. member, That's just a as a guest speaker. speaker. But um, what are you doing now? Well, I direct Ariel Ministries, which is a ministry dedicated to sharing the gospel with Jewish people, but also um, to uh, intensive Bible teaching from the Jewish frame of reference. We have branches now in 10 different countries. Was gonna, country number 11 will begin in September in Great Britain. And then we have our summer program in upstate New York in the Adirondacks. We have a two-week curriculum, a three-week and a one-week. And the two-week and three-week curriculum have a five-year cycle, so people have to come for five summers to get everything we offer. But the sixth week, because of the importance we teach the 25-hour version of this book, um, The Life of the Messiah from a Jewish Perspective. And we spend three hours in the morning, two hours at night, so at the end of one week, we get the complete teaching. And a lot of pastors come to that one, and other Christian leaders come to get that material because they, they can't usually afford to take off more than one week, but this one week they can take. Now, do you speak Polish? I used to, uh, growing up, I spoke Polish and Yiddish, but now I've lost most of it. I understand Polish, and I can, when two Poles are speaking, I can tell what they're saying, <laughs> but my, my, uh, my, my ability to speak back to them is very limited. Yeah. And what about trips to Israel? For years now, I've been doing a specialized five-week-long study tours of Israel. I'm doing one in just a couple of weeks, uh, for five weeks. 
and we covered the whole country from the north of Mount Hermon all the way south to Taba, which is south of Leilat. And we covered the, in detail every part of the land. Yeah. So two of our books are relevant to that. One is called The Study Guide of Israel, which lists every place in Israel in alphabetical order. So if you're just going down your own or some other group, you can look up where you are alphabetically. It'll give you more information than the guide will have time to give you. And then we also have a map book, which is maps things out that happened to the land from before the time of Israel, like the Egyptian period, all the way prophetically to the kingdom and so on. And so people, so people who come on our Israel tours get those two books and they're able to follow very well. Wow. And that's been the contribution we can make for people yeah. but that I cannot go on our trip, I can go on some other trip. You, you take the trip for five weeks? Yes. Wow. I go to the week in advance because I do the guidings, I take a lot of arrangements. A group comes in and then uh, I we, we don't use a tour bus, we use uh, four van, three or four vans. We're using the four vans this next trip. So that's why we limit that group either to 27 or 34. And it'll be 34 this time. And I, I drive the lead van. Two other participants drive the other three vans. They just follow me. And, and they have a list of things to read the night before. And then they see those places the next day. By reading and and where do you before. stay? Do you stay in regular? <clears throat> Hotels, or do you stay in the... In the in well, the, we begin in Jerusalem, the Jewish side, at Mount Zion Hotel, which overlooks the, um, the Valley of Hinnom and so on. And then we go to Galilee, we stay at a place called Ma'agan, which is a very nice kibbutz rest house. It's right on the south shore of the Sea of Galilee. Mm. Oh, wow. And they can just go from the cap and ride into the water. And then we stay for three nights in Akko and the north coast, three nights in Ashkelon on the south coast, two nights in the Dead Sea, two nights in Elat, and then we spend the last three nights in, um, in uh, Jerusalem again. We begin Jerusalem for, uh, for 11 nights and 10 nights in, in uh, Magan, Sea mm -hmm. of Galilee, and the other ones are, are short stays. Wow. Well, we have about a minute and a half, and we have prayed. We believe that we have Jewish friends that are watching now. What do you have to say to them about Yeshua HaMashiach? My admonition for those who are listening to this is, I grew up in a traditional situation, so I had certain things about Jesus that I was taught, but never really knew the real Jesus of the scriptures, the real Yeshua. And I would like to challenge any Jewish person listening to this program to simply get a hold of a good Jewish New Testament Read it for yourself and see if he didn't do what the Messiah was supposed to be able to do. I realize we have to separate the Jesus of, of Jewish and church history, the Jesus of Scripture. And we have to overcome our prejudices because of the persecutions we suffered in Jesus' name. But the Jesus of, of uh, Jewish and church history is not the same Jesus of Scripture. And that's the Jesus you need to look at and see if he was or was not. Wow. And there's your invitation to accept him as Lord and Savior. And what a change it will make in your life. It's true. You'll go from day to night or from night to day in your belief if you will only accept Christ as your Savior. And there is books, volumes of books written about this. That's right. And they're all for you. And you can get them all. God uh, bless. On <laughs> different platforms. So God bless you. Thank you for sharing with us today.